welcome to this week's Treasury Career Corner podcast, where I interview treasury professionals about their treasury careers. Each and every week, I talk to them about how they've built their careers, where they are now, and where they see both themselves and the treasury profession going to next. Let's get on with the show. This week's show, joined by Bruce Edmund, Senior Director and Assistant Treasurer at Citrix. Now, Citrix Systems, American multinational software company, cloud computing technologies, very much relevant in the current time. We're going through all this virus, you know, stay at home, lockdown, as it were. And that's one of the reasons why I'm talking quickly, because we've got, as Bruce and I were just talking about, I've got neighbors with kids bouncing on trampolines, and I'm trying to keep this moving along. So if you do hear background noise, listeners, there you go, that's the real world. You know, it's not normally like this. But it is this brave new world. Now, Bruce himself, assistant treasurer at Citrix, you'll be able to see his details. He's got amazing experience, you know, in some of the stuff he's done before, direct TV, there was global cash manager at Walmart. So he's got some really big, nice names. Originally started on the dark side, obviously started in banking. We'll let him off for that. He's okay. <laughs> Hi guys, it's all right. But Bruce, you can start your journey if you would, discovering, well, you started economics and French at your California stay bring us up to date, and then I'll interject with loads of questions. So, sir, over to you. It's your show. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, it's definitely been been a journey. It took me some, some time to figure out sort of where I wanted to head in my career. So, like you said, I ended up finishing my undergrad with an economics and, and French double major. I wasn't really sure where to go from there, but headed back to Europe, had some experiences there, and spent some time on FX trading floor at a bank in Brussels and really enjoyed that. And from that experience, decided to get an MBA and found the best school that I thought I could get into with my limited experience with a bit of international experience. And, and that was Thunderbird, which is a top rank international MBA. And really enjoyed that, learning about finance, things related to corporate treasury. When I finished there, I felt like the best experience would be to go and work for a bank and be exposed to, you know, working with a lot of different companies. So I'm, I'm dating myself, but it was Nations Bank at the time, which, you know, which is now Bank of America. And, and yeah, I'm coming from the dark side. I'm a recovering investment banker. So I ended up after some rotations, had a team in Miami, Florida, doing Latin, investment banking in Latin America. And it was really interesting time, great experience, traveling around, working on lots of different kinds of deals. I guess I would say from a personality point of view, the sort of the sales aspect wasn't really my favorite thing. So I started doing control searching and thinking, well, what I really want to do. And I kept coming back to my experience at Thunderbird and things that I'd liked, you know, in my classes. And I thought corporate treasury would be a good place to go. And, and typical of an investment banker full of confidence, you know, I went out applying to some really big positions, <laughs> which I didn't get calls back on. So how did you hear about Treasury by then, because you'd been Bank of America and you already been at RBC and Standard and been through those by that stage or not? Yeah, all of those, all of those banking experience had basically been best banking type roles and advisory. And, you know, I could see how Treasury worked at, at companies and I, and I knew people working in, in corporate Treasury. So, so I thought that would be a good fit. So I started looking for some positions and like I said, I mean, I kind of, you know, a little too much ego and, you know, went for some positions that I wasn't really qualified for at the time. But then, you know, I found a, a place, a direct TV Latin America in, in Fort Lauderdale and started really learning the nuts and bolts of treasury cash management. We went through a chapter 11 at the time. So I really got focused on managing cash day to day. That evolved. The company came out of chapter 11. News Corp bought our parent company and they moved everything to New York. And I wasn't interested in going there. And that's when I joined Citrix. So this is back in, in 2004 when I first joined Citrix and really loved the company. The fact that it was global technology company and we were really doing everything in treasury in a small team, cash management, investments, FX hedging, stock buyback, didn't really have any debt at the time, but really enjoyed it. So treasury really seemed to be my thing. I did kind of start to get tired of South Florida and that's when I left to join Walmart and I moved to Bendel, Arkansas. 
And Walmart, as everyone probably knows, is one of the biggest companies in the world. So that was quite an interesting experience of on the global cash management team and really learned a ton and worked with some great people. But I think people see like in their careers, you know, things either feel really right or there are certain things that don't feel quite right. So you're always kind of looking for like, what's the next thing that I should do to just get that right sort of niche. And I don't know, for me, Walmart was maybe a little too big. You've really got to sort of know how to manage, you know, politically, literally thousands of, of treasury people around the world to get things done. And so you would direct a global treasury, weren't you? So you explain again for the listeners, your remit, if you like, because you would kick some of these systems, you like, you got really strong systems bent to your background, but you've also got wider than that. So again, you know, you were overseeing how many people? Well, I was overseeing a small team in Bentonville, but you're relying on teams around the world, really thousands of people. You, you know, Walmart obviously is a retail company. And so you have to have treasury people on the ground, in every country handling actual cash, bank accounts everywhere. So it's really a huge operation. Whereas like a lot of other companies, you know, like tech companies, you have quite smaller teams and things are sort of more automated, you know, it's as many people. Yeah, it does. But, you know, but then with Walmart, as you said, you sort of, you enjoyed it for a period of time, but then you sort of, you were called back. So I think, so, you know, again, for the listeners, it's quite an interesting one. You were Citrix, Walmart, and then came back to Citrix. Was it the same company, just different, you know, a few years later, or how did they come back? Because again, people listening would go, wow, that's a bit. To return to the same company, that's quite unusual, I mean, say. Yeah, it is. It's interesting. You know, when I left Citric, the, really, the only reason that I left was that I was tired of South Florida. And some people, especially, you know, maybe if you're sitting in London where the weather's maybe a little dreary and gray, people think, are you are you crazy? Why did you leave South yeah. Florida? But, but when you... But when you live in South Florida year round, believe me, it's, it's not as great as it seems when you're just there for a few days on vacation. Um, so I really just left Citrix because I was tired of South Florida and I didn't, didn't think it was the greatest place to raise kids. So living in Bentonville was a good situation, I think, for my family at the time. But I wasn't 100 percent in love with my job. I mean, I liked it, but it, it wasn't like like the top. And so my former colleague at Citric contacted me one day out of the blue, very innocently, in fact, <laughs> you know, how are you? How are things going? And then, you know, at the end of the conversation, they said, hey, you know, your old position opened back up, you know, would you be interested in coming back? And I was really flattered that that they thought of me and I was interested in returning, but I really didn't want to move back to South Florida. But Citric being Citric, we enable mobility. That's really what we're about. And so we really work together to set up this position where I'm remote most of the time, but then typically, except for this period with you know, coronavirus, I travel to the office once a month for a few days. So it was really kind of the perfect setup because I still knew many of the people at the company. We really have low turnover. So I knew my boss, I knew my colleagues, I knew the CFO and lots of other people. So it was really an easy decision to go back to a company that I really enjoyed uh, working for. Was there any nervousness about you know, the way, not the way it might be viewed, but you did four and a half years away and, you know, or was it just like you want to progress yourself and did you feel that you were still progressing or the, the company Citrix and Citrix changed in that time? It's interesting because when I was at Walmart, I was doing some work on Tableau. If, if people know what that is, it's sort of like a reporting system. And I saw some statistics on growth companies and I'd seen that Citrix had doubled again while I was gone. When I started in 2004, it was about 750 million in revenues. It doubled in the five years where I worked, when I worked there. Well, it doubled again while I was at at Walmart and I was really impressed and I actually sent our, our CFO at the time a, a nice little message and he responded and Citrix always had a, this place in, I don't know, in my heart, I really just enjoyed working there. And so it had doubled and I had grown because I'd, I'd had this experience at Walmart. So I had seen a lot of new things and gotten to work on a, a lot of different things that I hadn't seen at Citrix. So coming back, it wasn't a super easy decision because you're going from a really large company, you know, back to fairly small company in, in comparison. But it just really felt like 
the right thing to do. And, and I really like the culture and what we do. And I'm especially proud to work there now during the crisis that we're having because of the mobility that we enable. I think and we've got a really great product. So I'm really proud to, to work for Citrix. Before that, I want to rewind. I, what I want to do is, so I did my pre-podcast call with Bruce over a month ago before this had really kicked off in any earnest and people were, you know, you know, working from home was starting to become, oh, it's the new norm. Oh, wow. And stuff. But I actually spoke to Bruce and it was still weird then. That was less than, you know, only a month or so ago because you explained how successful it is with you guys and how you did your weekly meeting and you do your other things. Can you, for the listeners, and again, they, some of them are going, oh, actually, we're going to need to adopt this. Talk through that remote working idea because that was going to be a, a theme of the show. Now it seems, oh, we're just jumping on the bandwagon. We're not. It was actually quite, you know, sort of natural. You know, how does it work then with you guys? Yeah, definitely. You know, it's not easy when you're not around, you know, your people physically all the time. You don't have those informal conversations, you know, in the hallway or in the kitchen. Those times are, are super valuable. I don't remember. It was at some point after I started at Citrix again, I set up basically a weekly touch base for our whole team. And, and I've got four people reporting to me underneath me, two people in Fort Lauderdale, one person in Switzerland and one person in Germany. So we're already spread out. I mean, even though those people work in an office, I mean, our whole team is not together. So we had these weekly touch bases on, on Monday mornings and we started out the meetings very informally where we really, I mean, it was everyone's choice. I mean, they could share what they wanted, however much they wanted or however little, but we really asked things like, oh, you know, how was your weekend? What did you do? And the kind of conversation that you would probably have, you know, in the kitchen when you're getting coffee on, on Monday morning. And that really helped us, I think, you know, come together as a team. I mean, one of our teammates was on like sort of fewer hours. Normally she wasn't able to join the call. And it really felt like she wasn't as much a part of the team when she missed those calls. And then she started to join the calls and it really improved, I think, the dynamic of the teams. So that was one thing that, that we started and we've kept doing, even though it seems a little bit like, well, what's the business purpose? You're having a call and you're talking about your weekend. Like, why, yeah. why are you doing that? But it really does serve a purpose. And now I'm seeing now that everyone is remote, that other people are doing similar things. They're setting up like, a coffee break type thing where people get on Zoom and a dozen people on there and just people are They're talking very informally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you say that the, you know, people got on board with that and things like that, in work terms, were you finding that you were discussing then is sort of you springboard into the different projects or was it very structured with that Absolutely. time or how did it work in treasury terms? Yeah. So start out the call, you know, very informally, uh, you know, how's your weekend? What, you know, what have you been doing? Travel, things like that. And then we would just go into things that we felt like that were important for the week. What's going on? You know, what am I hearing from my boss and, and other leaders? What are the other people on my team hearing? What's coming up in terms of cash or liquidity or FX hedging, any, any topic that's, that's relevant. We basically go around to each member of the team and, and they can talk about something. Maybe they have a question or they know something that's coming up and it's just a really good time that we get to talk about, you know, things that are coming up for the week. With you, Bruce, you've got some real passions in some of the stuff you talk about. You, you're a regular speaker at a lot of the Euro finances and talking about the future, because that's what I wanted to sort of get into with you that again, you were talking before we were talking about remote working and that works for you guys, which is really incredible. You know, that was one of the things, but then you've got a number of areas that you've got a passion for. Maybe just take a couple of those and explain to the guys listening today where you see treasury going and why, you know, that's a passion of yours. Okay, sure. I've always had an interest in, I guess, the technology side, treasury, you know, doing a little bit of coding here and there. And, and I see there's definitely been an evolution in treasury. A lot of times you have someone on your team that's sort of tech focused, you know, the, in the past, maybe with the Excel guru, right. That, that built all these big models. And I know for myself, I spent a lot of time 
automating Excel with VBA coding 10 years ago. And, and then someone introduced me to databases and I realized, well, <laughs> these databases are doing a lot of the things that I was coding in Excel. So this is a much better solution. And so then building out databases and then you start to see, you know, some of the limitations there in terms of like being able to pull in lots of different data sources and, you know, automate that in a way that's really reliable for somebody who maybe doesn't understand databases. And then that's kind of evolved into newer technology that help to do this on an automated way or things like, I mean, we're using Power BI a lot today. And now I've got somebody on my team who has really taken Power BI and and build a lot of, you know, automated pulling of, of data sources together and some reporting together. So I think there's just been this evolution of technology uh, within Treasury where, you know, there's a bit of a DIY, you know, do it yourself mixed with external software providers. And the providers always say, oh, you got to move away from Excel. Oh, you got to buy the system. And and that's great and everything, but I think most people listening to this, even at bigger companies will say, you know, it's always hard to get budget, right? Unless you're doing a big treasury workstation install, it's always hard to get budget because there's always other projects that are maybe tax or, you know, revenue related that have hard dollars that they're saving or generating. So even if you've got a good ROI, it's always hard to get dollars to spend on treasury projects. And when you say, you know, it costs and things like that, have you seen, you know, firsthand some of the rewards that is brought through with it? Again, we did talk about this before the call, you know, the last time and stuff. Where are you seeing that sort of really adding value to you guys? Where it's adding value to us is on the cash side. I mean, I think that's like the number one topic of, of a treasury person, right? Is always cash. Where's the cash? How much do I have? How liquid is it? Where is it in the world? You know, from a legal entity perspective, how can I get it to the locations where I need it? And I think the issues that, that I've seen over the years are, yeah, it's great when you have a treasury workstation, but then you might not have all of your information in that treasury workstation, or you might have multiple instances around the world. And so you're trying to, you're still, even though you've got that workstation, you're trying to pull together different data sources. You might have all of your cash balances in your workstation, but then if you have investment balances in a system like Clearwater reporting, well, now you've got two different systems. You need to mix those together. The workstation doesn't do it and Clearwater doesn't do it. So you got to do it yourself. And if you can't see that data together, it's, it's kind of meaningless because if you're only looking at cash or you're only looking at investments, you don't have, you don't have the whole picture. So going through that process and being able to build it out yourselves, you really learn a lot about the data that you have and you learn a lot about your business and the investments and your cash manager. So it's been really beneficial for us in that way. You talked there about some of the solutions and the team focus and everything else. How have you built that sort of brought the people along with you? Because they're, if they're quite a distance with, away from you, again, you and I spoke about this before, how have you brought them on that journey with you? What sort of do you do to sort of get them sort of motivated? Again, for some of the listeners today, they'll have the same. They'll have someone reporting into them from you know, Switzerland or someone reporting same country, but a thousand miles away. How do you sort of get them all in the same direction as yourself? Personally, I do mix of, I mean, I'm remote most of the time, but I do travel to our headquarter office in Fort Lauderdale, typically every month for like four to five days. The only time that that stopped is during this coronavirus lockdown. So we're spending time together every month. We get to sit side by side and work on things together. And then like I was saying before with the touch bases, we've got like a group touch base. And then I try to have weekly one-on-one -on -one touch bases with my direct reports. And then I have occasional like one-on-ones with, with the other people on the team, but we just try to keep the communication open. Then, I mean, in terms of the technology, I mean, it's, it's maybe been a little bit by luck, let's say, because you might get some person that naturally tends toward, you know, learning new technologies. But I think going forward, 
I think it would be more of a strategy. Like, you know, you might want to have like one person that's good at these kinds of skill sets and another person that maybe, yeah, they know finance, but also have like a technology kind of focus. So I could, I could see that being sort of a strategy going forward. For anyone that does go to a lot of these conferences, and that's where I've seen you before, things like Eurofinance and various other bits, we've talked about the sort of the strategy that you start to see there. What are you looking for when you go to those conferences and what would you recommend to other people that they should be thinking about? Is it just literally looking at how Treasury can be more strategic or how it can be more added value or all of the above? Or what's the sort of, what's your reason for, for doing this stuff and pounding the, and doing the AMRs as it were? Yeah, I think I'd say it's all of the above. I think, you know, you can have a plan going in that you want to learn certain things, but you sometimes you, you just don't know and you get there and then you learn things that you hadn't planned on learning or you meet people from, from companies that you didn't know about. And I think, you know, the networking is invaluable, right? You meet people from different companies, but they're all treasury people. So some things are different, but a lot of things are the same. You compare notes on, you know, systems or the way they're doing certain things, how they run their, you know, their hedging programs or investments that they do, debt, things like that, share buybacks. So I think, you know, those kind of conversations are invaluable. And then, you know, there are always sessions that, you know, about things that, that, you know, maybe you haven't worked on yet, you know, over the years, mm -hmm. you know, we've heard about blockchain and, you know, AI, lots of, you know, forecasting techniques. You know, I mean, we've heard uh, the last couple of times we've heard from Microsoft about, you know, them building out some of their own treasury technology. So you sort of never know exactly what you're going to get, but you always, I always feel like I get an enormous amount of value going to those conferences. And when you say that, is there any common path you, you found yourself, you know, because there are, you're meeting someone and they say, oh, do you know what? The, the key thing for me is this is my issue, you know, and this, another one will say, actually our systems are our issues or what are the common things that you've noticed? We trends, if you like. I think we're always comparing notes when we network because it's not easy to understand and evaluate all of these systems. Right. It's not like you're buying a car and, you know, you go and you pull up a bunch of research on um, different cars and this model or, you know, that model had these features and these great reviews. You don't have information sources out there, right? I mean, yes, you can hire consultants and they have some research and they can run a process for you and they can help you like learn all the different choices and everything, but that costs money. Right. So there's a cost benefit there. It might be worthwhile, but like I said before, it's always hard to get dollars in a treasury budget. So I think we're always comparing notes because it's hard to know like what's really out there. What do the systems really do? Are people really happy with them? Like what's it really like to, to work with that system or, or the other? Yeah. And people wise, because these are, you know, at the end of the day, the other side of it is the people are actually making it work and things like that. What's your ethos around? We've talked about you day to day wise, sort of mentoring your teams and things, but when you're looking for people yourself and you're looking to maybe recruit, what is it you're trying to find in them? Is it that, right, they must be technically really strong. And I want to see their systems or actually are they good team players or, you know, what are, what are the things that you're trying to sort of tease out from them something? Sort of I would say sort of all of the above, I'd say for better, for worse, we haven't had to do a lot of recruiting because we have really low turnover at Citrix and especially on the treasury team. But we did have a little, we participated in an internal rotational program. So we were able to um, see some different individuals within the company. And, you know, I think treasury, we have super high expectations, right? I mean, treasury people are always getting stretched and, you know, having to do more with less, you know, we all know that. So I think you're always looking for someone who understands, you know, how things work from a financial perspective, but are also a good team player and they're curious, you know, they want to work hard. So, I mean, you could have like sort of a great, well-rounded person, team player, if you get a little bit more of like the technical skills, I think that's a great bonus. But, you know, I think there's a place for a lot of different personalities in a treasury team as well. You don't want only, let's say, quote unquote, you know, nerdy tech people. I mean, you want somebody who's 
let's say, really good working with people and, you know, organizing a lot of things. So I think there's room for a lot of different personalities, but I think, you, you know, you just kind of want to try to fill in and, and have a very complimentary team. Yeah, and one of the video we did recently where there was actually Jean Philippe, a guy from Johnson Controls, and we talked about how different members of the team had a sort of complementarity. It was like, and everyone sort of one had strengths here, but then weaknesses there, and they sort of each of them slotted in, and each of them overlapped, sort of thing. Just as we wrap up today's show, because I know that Bruce has a you know hard stop soon. People, we're going to put in your LinkedIn profile in the show notes. Someone's going to look at you and say, "Do you know what?" I love respect, and I'd like to have a similar thing and life-wise and things. If someone is looking at that saying, do you know what, I want to want to be similar, what advice would you give to them? Would you say, right, go and study in California, do a bit of banking, then do this, do this. You know, or what are the, you know, when you're coaching junior people or things like that, what are the tips for success that you would give to people, would you say? Well, I'd say we're all different, right? Everybody's got to find their path, but I guess I would say, don't be afraid of like going off of what you think is the path, right? I mean, I started down the banking path and I realized, okay, it's, it's good. I, you know, like the experience, but you know, maybe this part was not, you know, I wasn't as passionate about like the selling, selling side. So maybe corporate treasury is, is more of my path. So I get into corporate treasury and then I was with like a Latin America focused company, a little bit small, and that was great, good experience, but I'd really like to be at more global companies. So then I joined Citrix and that was really fun. And, and then I think you're always kind of like trying to find like what works for me or, you know, what works for yourself and where are your passions and where can you really add value? Because people are going to see like the passion that you had. And so what I did in my first five years at Citrix and the passion that I had is probably the reason why they called me back after four years of being at Walmart and why they were willing to pay for me to fly in every month and do that rather than hire somebody brand new and bring them in, you know, locally and, and take a chance on somebody new. So I think it's just finding your passions, following them, you know, working hard and that's going to come out in your work and people are going to reward you for that. Awesome. On your complementary passions. There you go. I think that's a, a nice overlay sort of thing. We finish on time. We, we lots of good stuff there, guys. We'll put Bruce's link to his LinkedIn profile in the show notes. So you can have a look at that. And then if it's good, and you will be seeing when the any of the conferences restart, really. Uh, I think we've had so many of them cancelled this first half of the year, but they will be back and we'll be uh, catching up for some drinks. Definitely uh, maybe Barcelona or maybe in AFP. Vegas, who knows? You know, I'll look forward to seeing you. You know, for the listeners, any final words, you know, just, just words of advice in this uh, weird world, Bruce? Everybody just stay safe, you know, watch your cash. We're all, we're all looking at our cash right now and forecasting and stress testing. So everybody just be safe and hopefully, you know, we'll see each other soon at, at some conferences in person. And keep your head down. It's uh, yeah. amazing. Bruce, thanks for your time. Look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Mike. Thanks. So I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. Well, we're going to pick up the story from two years ago, Crumbs. Bruce and I released that back in June 2020. Slightly different world back then. We're 24, 26 months later. I'm catching up with Bruce. He was just telling me about how he's made a a move to a beautiful place in the US, but we're also talking about where we are now. I mean, talk us through, if you would, Bruce, what was that like? You guys, as we said on the episode, really embraced remote working. So that was less of a thing for you guys, but we were also talking about different companies are doing it as we've returned to work. And this. what about you first? And then maybe the wider world. So back to you, sir. Thanks, Mike. It's great to be back. It's interesting to see how things have evolved over the last couple of years. You know, obviously everyone was remote when the pandemic started and everyone figured out that, yes, it can work. And now a couple of years later, we're seeing some industries and companies, you know, wanting people back in the office, others being more flexible. So I think that's a really interesting topic. For Citrix, our offices are open, people can go as much as they want or as little as they want. And what we're seeing is people really 
aren't going that much. Really, I think it's because of, you know, commutes are long, the cost of commuting, just the time of commuting, getting ready, things like that. People are used to the advantages of being closer to their families or, you know, work-life balance, you know, working out, things like that. So I guess we're sort of in the hybrid camp. If we do have events in the office, people are going into the office. If it's maybe like a big meeting or I've been traveling to the office about once a month. And so then usually if I'm in town, then, you know, my team will show up in the office once or twice and and other teams are there. So that's kind of how we've been working. And I've heard from some other companies at some conferences that I've been at that have somewhat similar approaches or actually even more sort of definitive where they say, oh, we're fully remote, but we're getting together like once a quarter yeah. somewhere. So Personally, I, I think it's great to give people the the flexibility to to live where they want, whether it's locally commuting in or not. I think the f- flexibility is great. Yeah, I talked to one of our previous guests again, how to catch up, Leanne Perkins. She's a specialized bikes assistant treasurer over there. You probably see she'll be on stage with me at AFB when I see you later this year as well. In a similar way, she's based in Texas. They're based in California. And she said, she does this one week a month sort of thing a lot of the time. And she said, it's great, but it's a bit full on the week because she's just catching with so many people. She's, sort of, she's so tired after the week. It's amazing, but it concertinas her entire meetings. Yeah, I definitely know how she feels. Again, I've been doing this since 2014 when I came back to Citrix, basically traveling to the office every month for a week. So I know that feeling very well. It is tiring. They're super full days. But I always found those trips invaluable. I love just being at the office. I'll sit downstairs in our cafe on purpose just to see the random people walking by and see all of the people that I wouldn't normally see or that I wouldn't normally set up a meeting with. So, you know, those meetings are just invaluable. One thing I was going to say that I think is definitely a challenge for some companies. And fortunately, I'm looking for some wood to knock on. I haven't had to deal with any turnover in the team. And I think that's obviously a big challenge. If you've got new people coming on your team and you're trying to train people and build culture, I think, you know, that's something that you probably need to figure out, like in terms of maybe you have like more often Zoom meetings or maybe you do get together physically. So I I could see that changing things up a little bit if you've got new people in turnover. But otherwise, yeah, the hybrid approach has been great for us. Bruce, but in a way, I was just going to bring that up because, again, I'm looking back to the notes of the original show that people, again, would have just listened to. You pre-built flexible working. Whereas for lots of these companies, it's a brand new thing. And you said that people are struggling with this brand new way of working. I was, I gave a speech at a conference recently and it was great to chat to everyone. But the weird thing was, I even said five years ago, if I was hiring someone and they said, oh, what's your flexible working policy? (laughs) And I'd be like, you know, first round (laughs) interview, I'm like, get out of my office. What are you doing? Go away. Like, Zoom wasn't quite there. There wasn't all the facilities we have. and it, But it was less of that. My mind was closed to it because I thought, well, we have to be here on the phones. We have to, yes, the technology's caught up. But also I found that my brain's caught up. You know, I've said this a number of times. Carly, who works with me, she's based relatively locally, but she loves, she's very task focused and stuff. She loves working from home. That works for her. And I said to him, you know, way back when, I said, oh, but do you want, yeah, I'll come in the office. And I said, do you really want to? She was embarrassed about saying, no, no, I, no, I'm all right, actually. But we got over that. And I think that's what a lot of people have got to get over it. You know, and you mentioned there about, you saw some of the banking partners have followed a different path and things like that. What advice are you going to give to those guys listening? Because they, they might be listening going, oh, my God. Bruce says it's all right. (laughs) (laughs) It's super interesting how like the mindset has evolved, like you said. I mean, but we're Citrix, we're, our technology is about mobility and we would talk about mobility. I mean, I can hear our ex-CEO talking to like the credit rating agencies and some meetings and, you know, we, we would always say things like, 
work is not a place. It's something that we do. But even Citrix back before the pandemic, most everyone was in the office. You know, I was the exception. Few other people were the exception. And so what I think one of the positives from the pandemic is that now remote work is considered real work too. So that's a positive. And I think it's just like what you said with Carly. It's just about being grownups here and just saying what works. And I remember telling my team members before the pandemic, I've got a single mom on my team who picks up her daughter, you know, at school yeah. in the late afternoons, or early evenings. I told her, just do what works for you. Yeah. If you want to work from home, work from home. If you want to come into the office and then leave at noon and work from a cafe that's nearby the school, you know, it's best. Yeah. Just do what works best. And so I think that flexibility at Citrix has been great. You know, I'm, I'm not sure what I would say to the bankers. There is value in getting together physically. Yeah. I firmly believe in that. I really think my trips to the office are invaluable. You know, I just don't think it has to be like every day or every week. So I think the challenge is trying to figure out, well, when are we going to get together? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what's the format where to get the most benefit out of that? Yeah, exactly. And looking at the benefits rather than the task itself sort of thing. And coming back to Treasury itself, I know that you're a uh, people, we'll see you're a finance CEO then across in the US. And you talked about it before about how APIs and you're passionate about this and straight through processing two years on this technology, we've embraced technology in many ways for remote working, but also Treasury wise, where do you see the things coming through on technically? Treasury, that you know, what will you be telling these people at these conferences? It seems like APIs are are definitely taking off now. I think we were one of the initial adopters in the U.S. of APIs, and it's something that yeah, I've been passionate about just from my past experience using you know, sort of legacy host to host and, and Swift technologies for like treasury functions, like trying to use them for current day balances and urgent payments just wasn't quite optimal. So now it seems that we've gone from talking about APIs for a long time to like people are really using them now. Yeah, it's really been taking off. Um, I've talked to a lot of other companies that are working on proof of concept demos and also implementing those projects. So API seems to be a big thing right now. I'm happy with our implementation. You know, it's still going on. It's a work in progress. And a lot of that has to do with the banks and how they're progressing with the APIs. And, you know, we all, as a corporate treasury community, we all just need to kind of keep pushing our banks and saying, this is what we want. This is what we expect. And they'll answer it. They're building it out. So, yeah. Well, so I'm not going to take too much of your time. What we've taken to do with these updates, so you brought us up today very effectively there. People will reflect on the previous episode. That was great content. As we exit today, what are the takeaways two years later? What's changed in your head? And you've embraced that remote work. And we had that before, which time when it wasn't really happening, to be honest. But now it is. You're the futurist. That's it. So it's like, <laughs> Thanks. there you go. But what are the final words you're going to give to people? What's the sort of final say you're going to give it from here? I wouldn't pretend to be able to see the future, but I think hybrid work is here to stay. Flexibility. We're all mature. We all know how to work from anywhere. So I think that's great. Technology perspective, APIs will continue to sort of snowball and there's going to be more use cases and more adoption there because as treasury teams, we need current day, quote unquote, real time information. So that's going to continue becoming more mainstream. I think I'm really looking forward to the day where we truly can give up like our online banking access and, you know, physical tokens, carrying them around and really have one system that is reliable enough that we can log into and see all of our balances and transactions, do urgent payments, see that they went through right away and just like not rely on that. That's really like what we're focused on right now. Amazing. Thank you, sir. And looking forward to seeing you as we say in real life and, and we'll go from there. Amazing. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Mike. 
Hello, it's Mike here again. I hope you enjoyed this week's show. If you did, then maybe you want to follow the show or subscribe, depending on where you listen, whether that's iTunes, Spotify, or another great place to listen to the show from. It's totally free and means that you'll be the first to see each and every week when we release a new show. And maybe whilst you're there, you could even leave a quick review. Reviews and ratings are among the most important metrics for a podcast to effectively rank. And as you can probably appreciate, the podcast is a lot of hard work to produce every week. It'd be amazing. Just take, say, 20 seconds, leave a quick review of my amazing guests and their great career stories. We'd really appreciate it. Thanks very much, and I can't wait to see you soon.